What is it that you are the most afraid of? The monster inside of me is getting bigger. Munch, munch. Chomp, chomp. Gobble, gobble. Gulp. Munch, munch. Chomp, chomp. Gobble, gobble. Gulp. What I'm most afraid of Allow me to set the scene. You're browsing the internet one day, going through old internet horror stories. A lot of it is been there, done that. These stories are so familiar to you that they've lost all sense of suspense, the thrill and the horror. It was when these stories were unknown and unfamiliar, with an air of uncertainty of when the internet was this new, mysterious thing that you just assumed held nothing but the truth. That was what made them truly special. The idea that there was some unseen boogeyman or a fantastical monster, that those old video games that you played as a kid really were personalized, and that there was a tall man in the woods that killed people that looked at it, that bootleg game cartridges at flea markets were haunted, or that you would die if you didn't share a threatening email some random sent you. But you're older now, and none of that is really real. Even much more convincing and talented creators online nowadays are just that, creators rather than the real deal, no matter how well they sold it. You've already had a peek behind the curtain, you know that there never really was any magic to begin with, so why not go all the way and learn about how they were made? And so you decide to investigate old internet creepypasta, if only for the sake of nostalgia. The history of the stories themselves have been pretty well documented, but you're more interested in the images that frequently accompany them. There are easy ones, like a lot of the Sonic EXE images are just rips from DeviantArt. Jane the Killer and Tiki Toby are very obviously Tumblr OCs that somehow managed to gain traction, and Ben Drowned was part of an ARG. But it gets interesting when you delve into more unknown territory. Where did Jeff get his grin? Where did Eyeless Jack's mask come from? What's the deal with victim number one? You decide to dive headfirst into researching, but how would you go about presenting it? Well, thinking on it, shitty old amateur videos made in Windows Movie Maker had their charm, a throwback to when YouTube had a star-based rating system, and before the real horror was whatever kind of YouTube content slop would be spit out this week. So, in the spirit of old internet aesthetic that you've got going for yourself, you decide to commit fully to the look, and start making videos in the same vein, bringing back some of that old early 2000s internet magic and start uploading creepypasta image origin videos in the style of Windows Movie Maker. At first, everything's treading familiar territory. You know about Victor Surge, the something awful form competition that led to the creation of the Slender Man, alongside the many web series that he split off into, the admittedly silly story of Jeff the Killer, with the attached image's true origins left undiscovered even until this day. You make a couple of videos, and it's all going according to plan, and you're even getting yourself a little following of like-minded individuals that appreciate the classics. That is, until you start investigating the dog. As you start looking into it, you've realized that you're falling down a rabbit hole of information that nobody on the internet's ever really spoken of before. Unfamiliar archived websites, new images that make the ones commonly used in YouTube thumbnails look like they belong in a kid's show. It's almost thrilling, if a bit unnerving. You think to yourself, how has none of this been covered before? Hey, are you interested in the paranormal and unexplained? Do you like dissecting strange hoaxes and obscure horror? After you upload your entry on Smile Dog, you're noticing something strange. You're being spammed with emails from one account, all containing the same image, with a strange URL on the image attachment's name. You decide to follow the trail, 
entering the URL and finding a something awful thread full of nothing but the same spam. Well, at least this would be good for a follow up update video, so you might as well just download one of the images if you're going to use it in the video, for editing purposes. And the- <laughs> Not So come join the fun and visit ParanormalPrickheads.com today. This is the premise behind the internet web series Chainmail Chasers, a series that started off on May 24th, 2022, with the upload Slenderman Creepypasta Image Origins, shortly followed up by Jeff the Killer Origins where our channel lead starts off creating simple yet nostalgic videos researching the origins of the images used in classic creepypastas. In the first episode, they go over the well-known origins of Slenderman on Something Awful, but with the benefit of delving a little bit deeper. For example, using the seal of the city of Sterling on the Slenderman playground image in order to find out the original unedited image from the city's historical archive. This is an important piece of information showing that there's someone that's willing to put in the effort when going into a deep dive into content that they're researching, for better, or for worse. This level of research continues on into Jeff the Killer origins, where the channel lead looks into Jeff's origins, noting prominent non-Jeff related appearances, such as the screamer on Agorio, as well as the now debunked rumors of its origins as an edit of a bullied person on 4chan who sadly took their own life. They do find connections to an obscure Newgrounds account by the name Killer Jeff, claiming to have made the image in 2005 and then making the story around it later, although this is put into question. They are unable to find the original image, only knowing about the instances that emerged in 2005 in the Japanese internet, alongside rumors that 4chan users have been messing with it ever since 2004. The third video in the series begins much like the other two, however this video includes some harsh criticisms by the channel runner on the quality of what they dub as the YouTube thumbnail version of the Spile Dog image. This critique shows that they have some expertise in image editing. The episode provides fairly standard trivia about the creepypasta, such as a proposed origin of the dog image, and the origins of the photoshopped human teeth that the thumbnail dog image has. They also go over the Polaroid version of the Smile Dog image, which they admit to not being able to find much other than it emerged after the thumbnail version of the image. After attempting to find the source and then failing, they attempt a final Hail Mary to get the original image by amalgamating the origin image and the Polaroid and running that through the reverse image search engine or website Tinai, only to be met with this. Those more familiar with the Smile Dog Creepypasta may be a bit more confused. This specific dog image hasn't really been in any kind of creepypasta related media before, nor has it been included into other dives into the dog's origins. That's not even in counting for the website that it's hosted on, Paranormal Prickheads, and the date that this image is labeled with, 2007, which the channel runner notes predates the creation of the original creepypasta story in 2008. What happens next? I'll let play out. Okay, so I put that, uh, like this is just an update, I put that one website into the Wayback Machine and I got this. This thing is fucking old and uh, click anomalies, boosh. You got all this shit, and then you click chain letters, and then you go up here, 
and then you have all these different chain letters you can look into and then you click on smile and then smile takes you here and this is interesting because it had it a smile god loves you a uh, smile is an old chain letter that features an image of a dog grinning he he that threatens the receiver with nightmares and death if they do not spread the email Well, isn't that convenient? Our channel masters have done us the favor of including our protagonist's name in the subtitles. The first thing that I want to note here is the date that's set on Grace's computer, and the actual date of the video upload don't match up. Grace's computer marks the date as the 26th of May, 2019, while the YouTube video itself was uploaded on May 28th, 2022. I believe that this is our first clue that something is afoot. Why would there be such an enormous time gap? But that's just a question I'll put on the back burner for now. Grace goes on to read the rest of the article, noting that the Smile Chain Letter has been seen as early as the 90s on Usenet, which is essentially the predecessor to the modern online forum. This suggests that the Smile image is much, much older than we initially thought. I'm not sure if, like, I don't know, I haven't read the post in a long time, like the smile.dog one. I don't know, like, that might be the time that said that the uh, image was floating around. I can't remember, but, and yeah, it's obscure, but persistent, and he has, like, a, a dumb little joke here. And then he says the image looks like shit, which, I mean, this this weird-ass image does. Like, I don't- like, I guess this is supposed to be, like, JPEG loss, but... You cannot make an image that bad that way. I don't- that's fucking nasty. And then it mentions the Polaroid. And... That means this just is, like, the direct precursor to the Polaroid image, and... Then we have this, which is like some fake image from some 4chan guy. You could kind of tell because like it's it's just not the angle it doesn't really line up. But it's fucking like I did not expect that there would be old older traces of this creepy pasta. Like I figured that. If, if there's something like this, then someone else would have found it by now. And I am just kind of befuddled. Like, I, I, I'm, I was going to do the rake next. Like, I, I wanted to do the rake next. Even though, like, the, the rake is, like, a few, like, well-known images. It's not, like, known for them or anything. But I know one of them had, like, the fallen angel in Catalonia. The other had, like, a shitty trail cam edit. Anyway. But... Now, I don't know, I might have to keep looking at this, because it's, yeah, like, I, I guess if you guys can find it. The fact that nobody else has covered this before doesn't make any sense. Why hasn't something this massive been found by now? This obscure old internet website seems like such an important piece of old internet horror media history, so why is it gone? The only form of it it has now is an archive on the Wayback Machine. Why is it that such a famous creepypasta can have ties to this place, and yet remain completely under the radar until now? Although, it is a bit fun to see a basic or primitive, so to speak, website formatted and set up the way that this one is. It's definitely a throwback to the old internet, before professional looking website domains were able to be created and bought easily from template websites like Squarespace or Weebly. This whole website's aesthetic definitely does scream graphic design is my passion, but that's certainly part of its charm. But back to what's relevant. What is relevant here looks to be this image right here. This red image. 
The article claims that this red image is what has been circulating around the internet, with there being hints and rumors by the internet goers about the Polaroid image, which I assume refers to the one that we all know about. Following this, Grace calls out this monitor image to be a glaringly fake edit from how the image doesn't match up with the angle of the old monitor that it's displayed on. It's hard to see the finer details, but it is clear to see that this is some kind of image related to Smile Dog, stated to be one of the older images. Once again, let's note that the red Smile Dog image dated this entry as 2007, before the creation of the Smile Creepypasta in 2008. And this article is saying that the image on the monitor is even older than that. It's unknown how old this thing could be, but it certainly means that there's a lot more to the origins of this dog picture than we initially thought. There's also Grace's suspicions of the red dog image. She knows that you can't get an image to become as crusty as that is through simple JPEG image quality loss. It could be explained away as a photo edit, but she speculates that this image is a direct precursor to the smile Polaroid image. However, there's these details that look so far removed from this red image. The dog silhouettes are completely different, and then there's this presence of a human hand. The grin is much more subdued, and yet all the more intimidating, and the most obvious difference being that the Polaroid isn't nearly as red. All of this screams rabbit hole that you stumbled on a whim, and it's absolutely glorious. After the last episode, Grace's email has since been flooded with responses, although not many of them are from fans, but a single eccentric spammer and one real person. For now, we'll save this non-spam response for later, it's the spam emails that have the most immediate intrigue to them. If we take a minute to look at the spammer, we'll see that they're calling themselves things like friend or cool friend, egging on the receiver to take a look at the file image attached to it. What I would note is the wording and the language used by this email being very similar to the language used in the Smile Chain Letter article on the Paranormal Prickhead's website. It certainly rouses suspicion. Look at this first one. Open for a rare chance? For dog video? Smile, happy, help you, happy face? Just spreading the word. Now isn't that a familiar phrase? When our protagonist clicks on the spam email, we have an address to attach to our mysterious messenger, grinfriend at gmail.com, which Google flags as potentially not being a real address. It's starting to look a bit more and more obvious, but it's reasonable to think that this could just be some quirky kid that's making creepy art showing off eccentric behavior, although this chipper text is immediately contrasted with what this happy dog looks like. Looking at the provided image, it's nothing like the smile images that we've seen in the past. The shadows on the face create this aura of dread, an uncaring intimidation. It gives off this impression of being dormant, like a ghoul that could spring to life at any moment. Given what topic that we're looking into, call me paranoid but I for one wouldn't give this link the time of day if only to practice basic internet safety. However, our channel head is certainly much more brave, or at least foolhardy than I am, opting instead to follow the trail and use the URL set in the image name. This leads to a something awful forum thread from several years ago. I'll let this scene play out for itself. We're back on the screen recording again. Um... As you saw with those emails, there was one legitimate person which was just interested in the video and wanted to help, I guess. And then there were like a billion fucking spam emails from the same guy, I, I assume, anyway. And even though those spam emails sucked shit, they did have the full image file for this. God, I fucking hate cars. They're so fu- Ugh, why- 
Everyone here drives big, giant-ass trucks, and they're so loud. Anyway. But there, there's one again. Oh my fucking god. Um, anyway. Uh... I think in the original pasta... I, I did go back and skim through it after last episode. It did mention that there was a something awful thread or maybe just like the site in general where <laughs> it says a hacker did it but I think I think it's just like a shitty spammer seeing this thread but they just spammed the smile dog picture everywhere and I don't I, I guess the thread's real it's on Wayback Machine I don't fucking know but It's interesting. So you have this guy with the image. And then you go swoop onto an ad. And then he just fucking repeats this a billion times. <laughs> and then this guy comes in. He gets really pissed off. Googly moogly over here. Ain't, ain't having it. And more dog 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 there's like yeah it's like each of these is three it, it tends to be like around three posts per minute from this guy and then when you get to ten it's like one two three four Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, twelve fucking posts in a minute. And yeah, Googly Moogly's up there. Is there anyone else? No, you have the two posts at eleven. Okay, yeah, there is this guy. And what the fuck? That's uh, that's another one. I mean, it's it's clearly like from from the same thing as this, but like, I mean, Huh. Well, um... I adore the execution of this entire section. Getting pissed at a truck driver just driving by? It's a little bit of fun touch of realism and it's an excellent piece of character acting and characterization. There's the fact that the spam email contains a full image version of the paranormal prickhead's monitor image, although that begs the question of how this person even got the image, although I do have my suspicions that this mysterious spammer is our source. There's also the fact that the details line up immediately with the original creepypasta, which did state that at one point someone had flooded something awful with, quote, a deluge of smile.dog pictures. There's this consistency or continuity that the series has to call back to the original story to flesh it out and expand on it that I find truly mesmerizing, something that I can really, really appreciate. In terms of structure to the horror, there's special attention paid to the music and the sound. When Grace is casually strolling through the thread and riffing off on its contents, as she approaches the bottom, all sound just cuts off. By then you've already gotten used to the music, and the repetition of the same image may be getting old. It's become a comfortable background white noise, which makes it all the more dreadful when that noise is taken away in its entirety. The initial removal of the music with the clicking cutoff that snaps the viewer to attention, what just happened, followed by this creeping crawl to the bottom, only to be met with this. This image is absolutely horrifying. The pose, the lighting on the monster, and that intimidating dead eyeless stare. 
It's like a sleeping beast in stasis, just lying in wait for some poor fool to stumble across its lair and poke it awake. Given the context of the rest of the scene, however, it could be viewed as the immediate follow-up to the spam image. The spam image could very well be interpreted as the beast sleeping. It's not active yet, all's well and being left alone. The sleeping dog is left to lie. That is, until Grace comes along, scrolling through long dead threads that should have stayed buried, scrolling through the images of this internet grave until something starts to stir in its slumber, and then that something wakes up. It's awake now, and Grace decided to give it a new home. Welcome back. After the events of the last episode, Grace gets in touch with the person who sent the sole non-spam email, one Arthur Murphy. She gets into contact with Arthur, who implores Grace to suspend her disbelief, if only for this one conversation, and be perfectly justified in never contacting him again if she thinks that he's spewing garbage. It's almost desperate, but Grace is directed to look right at the visual glitching that happened immediately after she downloaded the smile image. Uh, pause it. Okay, wait one second and pause it again. Pause, yeah. You see that in the corner? Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of fucking weird. Um. Looks kind of like mold or whatever, but what? I, yeah, that must. What I think happened here is you can see that it's in line with the the image or whatever. And above it, you have like all the other small ones, and this kind of looks like. You think so? I want to, I want to say it kind of looks like like curtains or something. I can't remember if that mm. one above one had curtains, but. Speaking of curtains, is that? Ah, never mind. Does is that a window, right there? A mirror? Where? Nothing? In the photo. In the photo. In, in the in the dog. Yeah, the dog. I mean, it looks it looks more like a patio door or something. I mean, you got the the, the floor and the vent right there. Really. All yeah. right. Um. Wait. Oh. Uh. Actually. Wait. Wait. No. This is similar to the above image. Hmm? So, yeah, no, the above image didn't have curtains, so. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know what that is then. Um, actually, okay, wait, can you actually um turn off the screen share real fast? Um, can, can you? Uh, okay. I... Uh, okay, so... Can you know the smile dog um image? Like you downloaded it? Yeah, I, I yeah. Can you open it up a few times? Like like you want me to screen share it or No, no. Can you just yeah, just open it up a few times on your own? The fucking okay, like just oh, Yeah. Fuck. Is it? Oh sh! Oh shit! Um. What? Yeah. Uh, hold on. I gotta. It's this moment here that leads up to the scene that made me truly appreciate the series and got me to fall back in love with internet horror. Easily one of my favorite scenes in recent horror media.
Hey, so, um, I was told that I should open the image multiple times. I don't understand why. Uh, what the fuck? I'm, I'm not talking to a JPEG. I, I, why do I? What, what the fuck? Oh my god. So, just tell me how. Did you, um... How the fuck did I know what I was thinking? If I... What? Oh, hell no. Fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> There is so much to unpack in just this short section of the video. It only lasted about four minutes, but it's so amazingly impactful, a masterful payoff to the slow burn buildup the rest of the series served as. This is the scene that got me to fall in love with this web series, a slow, ominous buildup, a slow burn of increasingly unnerving situations that culminate in a direct confrontation with the monster, something that you can never truly fight back against. The confrontation between Smile Dog and Grace is simply masterful, playing with how we understand things to work. From a meta standpoint, this entire scene just appears like wizardry to me. The inclusion of changes to the image every time it's opened and closed, the changing of the file extension, 
the smile dog infested file details, and the eventual GIF conversion that's all just fantastically well executed, way above and beyond what you'd expect from such an obscure horror series. It's just so creative and amazing in its execution. I've never seen anything like this happen before, playing with the medium of how people expect files to work, amazingly spooky on the side of the creators. But there's also that snide, yet cold and intimidating personality that we have on the side of Smile. You know something's about to go extremely wrong the entire time, interacting with what the viewer knows to be some sort of haunted or supernatural entity, however you're not met with a feral, animalistic terror, a predator. It subverts this idea not by being met with feral fury, but with a cold intelligence. Although this may make Smile seem less alien or inhuman and potentially less terrifying, it's in the revelations made here in how it interacts with technology and messes with grace does Smile become more and more intimidating. In its own words, I am a thinking curse. It immediately drops the bombshell that it transmits spores through neurons, digital, and the flesh. This information is left to simmer briefly before Smile brings up that your brain stores images too, stating that just by looking at it and being stored in Grace's and possibly even the viewer's memory, it's already spread, it's propagated. In essence, Grace is cursed now too, not just her laptop synapses of metal. That's what makes Smile Dog's portrayal so memorable. It knows that it's not the source of what's going on, just being an instance of the smile entities, but being malicious, calculated, and in control the entire time. He's an amazing horror villain. One of my favorite tropes in horror, or media in general, is the concept of the info hazard, or cognito hazards. For those who are not in the know, cognito hazards are pieces of information or media that are inherently dangerous to experience or observe with one of the five senses. A famous example of a cognito hazard is the tape from the ring. Just by watching the contents of that tape, you're immediately marked for death by the specter of Sadako. However, cognito hazards aren't limited to just those that cause immediate harm. They can cause psychological damage or hypnotize you into doing something. It's just so unpredictable, and the fact that all of these things can just happen to you just from sensing the hazard is just cosmically terrifying. What's completely terrifying about Tognito Hazards is that they play with one of the most, if not the most, important habits that humans have developed in order to survive. The ability to learn and adapt, using information to our advantage. The cognito hazard makes it so that our curiosity becomes a direct liability. Knowledge is power, yes, but it's also comforting in a sense. There's a reason why some people who watch horror movies or let's plays go to the comments to find timestamps for all the jump scares. The information and the knowledge itself gives a sense of power and agency, the potential to retaliate somehow in the face of an unknown threat. However, what if it's the information that is the threat? What if when you arm yourself with knowledge, it's the knowledge that stabs you in the back? That's absolutely something that you can do nothing against, and in the case of Smile Dog, it could not just harm you, but it can propagate and create more of itself just by looking at an instance of it. Grace mentions having suffered frequent headaches ever since the encounter with Smile, having the monster sitting across her bedroom, turning on the computer, and laughing all the while. Grace is stuck with Smile, whether she wants it or not. This leads us to episode 5, 
the rake, although you're not met with Grace, but rather with someone new. This is Davy, a friend of Grace's who's taking control of the channel in the aftermath of her confrontation with Smile Dog. His creator style is quite different from Grace's, doing away with the Windows Movie Maker aesthetic in favor of doing a more traditional coverage style that you would see in more modern content creators, right down to shilling the channel using subscription statistics. The actual coverage of the rake is not what's important here, more so the presence of audiovisual glitches, likely glimpses of activity from Grace's newest passenger. For example, the almost dog-like drawing of the rake has many visual glitches, alongside many visual issues that are made present very briefly throughout the video. I would like to note that it's specifically the dog-like rake image that has visual glitches on it. It could be that this is Smile hinting that they're somehow related. However, this is mostly just speculation on my part. These glitches will be brought to full attention and covered in full next episode. After the rake video, Grace confronts Arthur and Davy, specifically regarding the rake video and the visual glitches that were added in an attempt to get them to believe in the recent supernatural happenings. Uh, sorry, what's up? Like, I just wanted to show you why I've been so frustrated these these past few days. Uh, like, I don't know if you're just trying to mess with me. I I know that's that's not really your deal, but. I just... Yo, what the fuck, Who are you talking to? A fucking Davy. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Is this about the? Because I don't get what this has to do with the video. Okay, I don't even. I don't even know if like anyone saw it. I don't know how. Some of it's pretty obvious. But... And frankly, bad ass drawing. Of the... There was. There was. Hold on. The uh, what? Right there. Hmm? You, you, the the, the visual glitches. The visual glitches on on the computer. It it was in it was in the video. I yes. Yeah, so. You edited it in? No, no, I didn't. I Ooh. why would you even assume that I did that? There's like I, I don't know because. Maybe you just have a shitty program, I don't know. Well, Why maybe like YouTube so? fucked it up. It's, this is the know. this is the raw download. Like this this is as it as it was saved. You just got a fucking computer virus. Why why okay, oh, no, okay, I'm that's stupid. To... After this, Grace goes on to highlight different abnormalities within the rake video specifically the image of the news report. Personally, I don't see it, but I do see some possible candidates for what she's referring to, but Arthur and Davy don't see anything either. I've tried interpreting these images as charitably as I could, and the closest I got to a smile appearance was this nasty patty looking skull. However, Grace scrubs near to the end of the rake video. Oh, but... Oh, we're, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. There's still more. There's three of these fucking things. Okay? Uh, okay. Like, look, look. Look. <sighs> okay, if this one is... If it comes in. Yeah, you probably can't see that. So, I just get the screenshot it again. fine just okay what the yeah yeah what, you, what you see like... I, I i see i see that is that a face yup you can see the cheek you can see the nose Fuck. i think that's the chin you can see the fucking neck muscles even 
the fuck? Wait, so that was from the video, like, Darken or whatever? Yes, yes. So actually, I'll, I'll just, I'll just straight up play the clip. I'll just straight up play the clip. It, Please you do. You don't have the full context, but whatever. Our investigation in yeah no no yeah no davy's voice is just muffled that whole time like for, for a solid like three seconds and uh, you actually have oh yeah over here you have audio <laughs> warbling too like wait listen listen the insomniac game resistance three it is it's very laggy in the, in the video to show player. an enemy from, from the game here we called a group when i would be a ghost when i listened to that recording before I send it over to you, it was fine. Did, did you just not tell me, or is this like? I, I don't know. I can, I can, I can listen to it again. <laughs> okay, that's totally different. But the audio is it possibly just like I don't know, made a mistake. If there's a ghoul over it, why uh, would it be a fuck up? Uh, you know, coincidences happen. You you know how fucking stupid that is, right? I get, okay, yeah, I know. Listen. Fuck, I don't know. Uh, okay. And here, here, yeah. Look, this is what I was talking about. This is what I was talking about. There's more stuff here. Like, you got, like, a broken... Is that... Is that, like, a Google logo or open original disc? I don't know. But, look, you have you have text down here. That's not like this is clearly the rake. I don't know what May thirty first, two thousand twenty something. Like, what does that mean? What is that supposed to tell me? The the future. Yeah, but what? <laughs> what? Uh. Fucking, I don't know. Like, because as far as I'm concerned, the the fucking JPEG I opened is threatening me. <laughs> Do you not? Okay, Do not understand my concern I... here. No, no, no. You no, saw, listen. you saw the video. You saw the last video I mean, where no. it was waking me up to laugh at me. Yeah, I just got, I, I realized I was saying stupid things. Um, I kind of okay. Listen, I believe you. I don't want to be that guy in the horror movie who doesn't believe the person who's obviously fuck shit is happening. Yeah, I know you're okay. You wouldn't mess with me like this, right? I can trust you on that. Yeah, so, I, I'm more likely to okay, mislead then, you then by. I'm more likely to mislead you by just sheer delusion than anything. Okay, well, uh, if this is delusion and it's a shared one, so I guess we're on the same page. Yeah, no, like fucking true that. Like evidence is right there. This. Is yeah. Uh well I do think that there you no, know, I know that there is something going on here. Like I I've, okay. I've had like I've put up a similar bullshit as you like in the past. But it's you know do you know what it is. Do you know what to do with it? That's a loaded question. Uh How is it loaded? Look, look. You brought up like a virtual machine earlier. Yeah. Yeah, you could just do that. Would I, I guess. just would I literally just be able to put the picture of the dog inside there? Cuz as far as I'm yeah. concerned, if I delete that, I don't even know the moral implication of that first of all. And secondly, whatever this is is something that kind of needs to be exposed for what it is. If you catch my drift, because, like, obviously, you have so much media from, like, the past eons of humanity, and none of it, all of it's just hoax crap. Like, this is just, I don't know why people haven't found this before. I don't know why it hasn't been covered by everyone with a budget, but it's, yeah. it's, it's very stressful, okay? Like, j just... Yeah. And I, I don't want to deal with the stress, but I don't want to just give up. How much do you value your computer? 
I mean, I do not have much money. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you can sell it and be like one of those like, shitty, like creepy pastas where it's oh like smile god. talk in your computer. Dude. Oh my god. <laughs> but all jokes aside, uh, blah, 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 uh, I maybe like there's always shitty cheap ones that you can grab and just you know do put a okay. fucking hey, virtual machine on it. Listen. You're saying you dealt with this and you, you don't have any other solution other than just to throw the entire computer out. Dude, it's literally like some ghost. Like, I'm not even gonna hide it. That 100% is some supernatural thing. And and you know this. You know this how? Are you like, just look at it. You know, dead well that all this bullshit related to whatever the hell we've been doing, like, it's abnormal. So why not throw it oh, out? Shit. Like. It's clearly not productive to keep it around. Look, I'll agree with you on that. I don't think we need to touch this. No, it, yeah. Like, it's not smart to just even try to keep it around. But... Yes, exactly. And congratulations for getting to that point. Now, if you, you know, as I said for the billionth time, the virtual machine idea could be a pretty, you know, decent idea. But if you do value it, I doubt that, you know, recycling if like a few parts of this PC could even help. Like you, unless if it's a laptop or something. But are you saying it's in everything? What's worth noticing here is that Arthur obviously has some limited experience with the situation, or at least has been exposed to smile dog like entities in the past. Despite this experience, however, Arthur has provided next to nothing but lackluster solutions, very clearly speculating on what to do with the computer, posting the smile image. They're all completely unaware of what to do barring just throwing Grace's computer away, and even then, it's unclear if even getting rid of the thing would get rid of Grace's thinking curse. If anything, it would just make it angry. Uh, oh no. <laughs> Great. But, okay, like, well... So far you know it's in the hard drive, so... Here's the other thing, right? It's... Mm -hmm. Like when I talked to it, well talked, like it it got it kind of knew what the conversation was before I did. But mm -hmm. it like do you really think if I deleted that thing that it would just leave me alone anyway? I, it, I it, don't it, know. It, if it I was them, I'd be pretty pissed off. It, yeah, no. That's what I'm saying. And this thing is probably listening right now and is probably shaking in anger at you I, for saying that. I, I bet. Mean, can we not invoke the fucking demon right now? Hello. Please. I cannot believe Please. we're discussing the moral implications of deleting a JPEG. Well, it's, I'm not sure if it's a JPEG, you know. I mean, technically, right now it's a GIF. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, man, I kind of want to provoke it, but okay, the no, same I'm, I'm, I'm cutting the fuck. Why? I'm... I love this interaction between the trio here. The fact that it's an extremely awkward Discord chat can hit really close to home for some people. It's unstructured, chaotic, fumbling, almost in a parody of YouTubers that make obviously fake, scary story slop and get millions of views out of it. There's this feeling of a bunch of kids stumbling upon something they really shouldn't have and not knowing what to do about it. There's this level of disbelief, like people are people who are very familiar with horror media and its tropes and being put in a situation that matches up with the plot of a half-baked creepypasta that they'd be reading as a kid and making fun of as an adult. It's extremely surreal, a ridiculous thought and incredibly silly, but they can't argue with what's going on right in front of their faces. We see a lot of attempts at coping with the situation through humor, making half-joking suggestions on what to do and with the situation they're in. 
Davy doesn't want to be the guy in the horror movie that doesn't believe in those in the know until it's too late. He's trying to grasp for any kind of rational explanation. For example, while he acknowledges that the image of the ghoul may be supernatural in origin, the muffled audio during its appearance may just be a perfectly explainable issue with the audio equipment. Grace calls this out, to which Davy responds with it just being a coincidence. Grace is desperate. Her exasperation comes from her frustration with the situation. She's basically cornered on all sides and is scrambling for help from the people that she trusts, or at least the two that are immediately available. The third person, Arthur, is the one that I hold the most suspicion towards. Most of his dialogue involves some sort of joke, as is expected with someone wanting to exert some sort of personal control over an uncontrollable situation. However, there are half-serious, half-jest suggestions that Arthur likes to throw out there, if only to get the idea in Grace's head. It's strongly hinted that Arthur had, or maybe even currently has, smile problems going on right now. After all, he's the one who told Grace to open and close the smile image, inciting direct first contact between the image entity and its new carrier. I suspect that Arthur isn't nearly as trustworthy as one would think. The suggestions of throwing the laptop away or deleting the smile image do make sense, but there's also the possibility that it would just cause the haunting to get worse after pissing off the entity. And there's the idea of putting smile in a virtual machine as a suggestion. The ending statement of, I kinda wanna provoke it, note how Arthur can't really give a concrete answer on if he knows how to deal with the smile entities or not. He wants to remain a figure of authority on these entities when he's not. Why? It could be simple pride, but I propose that Arthur is using Grace like a lab rat, a test subject to experiment with how to deal with smile entities. These suggestions and the way that Arthur carries himself make me immediately suspicious about his motives and intentions. This is a seemingly standard episode of CC, again, with Davy as the host of the episode. It explores the origins of the victim number one image from the Mario creepypasta. The most important part of this video is the discovery of the channel Ice Cream Monkey Fan, dated back to August 8, 2008. Although, if you look at the actual series playlist for yourself, you can note that there's a difference here. All of the Ice Cream Monkey Fan videos are hosted on re-upload channels rather than the original article. The video itself is in a cheesy Windows Movie Maker style, similar to the first three Chainmail Chaser videos, with Monkey Fan sharing the chain letters that they have been getting, alongside the spooky images that they contain. The video shows off the same ghoul image that was put into the Chainmail Chaser's rake video, which Grace showed off to the group in frustration, an extremely potent find here. There's also this image, which appears to be some kind of variation on the smile image, given the canine features. The real-life origins of this image have in fact been documented, which Davy gives credit to, with Midnight Crick's video if people want to look for it, which I will also link in the description. This can serve as a sort of subtle hint that this isn't real, or confirmation that this is a web series, because the origins in Crick's video is completely different and contradicts the conclusions reached in the Chainmail Chaser series. I actually really like the inclusion of the Ice Cream Monkey fan channel into the series. It seems to be a callback to classic internet horror tropes of the plot-relevant secondary channel. Ice Cream Monkey fan is to this series what To The Ark was to Marble Hornets, and I find the homage to be very, very cool. Alright, we're here. Interrogation. I'll be honest, this is my definitive favorite episode of the entire series. Please, 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 if anything I've said so far has caught your interest or have been interested enough to get this far into the video, I implore that you go and watch the original. They need the views and this web series is obscure enough as is. Give them views and subs, it is a good series. I'll give you some time to pause and go watch it. 
I'll wait. Back to the analysis. Or, if you didn't go watch it yourself, let's get back to the summary and then some gushing. The episode begins with text explaining that in the aftermath of the confrontation with Smile in question slash update 1, Grace has been suffering mounting stress and psychological damage, suffering in silence. To her, if this problem won't go away, then she'll face the issue head on and confront Smile. I'll play the whole confrontation. I genuinely cannot do it the justice that it deserves. All right, so for the viewers at home, I put this thing into a virtual machine and locked down file transfer between the the host and the the thing, the the virtual machine. And my goal here is to try and ask the thing some questions. I mean. I figured I have to have some sort of leverage over it because it's a fucking demon. I, I, I'll, I'll do it. Like, you're ruining my fucking life. I'll just cut straight to the point so we can both get this over with. Is there any way I can get you out of my head? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ! You are not twisting the only person who knows something about you as a bad thing. And why would I trust you over an actual normal person? You're a fucking dog. Picture. You just you just turn on my fucking TV. Where where? What is that? No no no. no. Stop! 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 Please stop. <laughs> I don't know what that thing is. Alright, I'm guessing that you can see now why I called this my favorite episode in the entire series. Let's go back and break this down each individual part of the episode just to show off how great this scene is in the culmination of absolutely everything the series has shown us so far. The first thing established is that Grace put the Smile JPEG image into a virtual machine with file transfer turned off in an attempt to get some leverage over it like putting the dog in a cage, so to speak. It's a feeble attempt at best. You expect something like this to fail against the supernatural entity. A well-made piece of mundane malware could compromise a virtual machine, 
but I suppose that's part of the horror of it. You know something like this will ultimately fail, but you at least have to try. It makes it all the more terrible when exactly what you'd expect happens. The way that it happens though is such an interesting set of events. When Smile takes over the virtual machine, he appears to be contained inside. The corruption, so to speak, only spreading inside the confines of the VM. However, it does show us how powerful it's been this entire time, easily able to take over technology. An extremely interesting detail is the way that Smile's wallpaper form, as I call it, shifts organically, contracting and expanding, like it's breathing in and out. It really drives home that this is a living organism, not just a computer file or an AI, if that hasn't been obvious enough already. Smile establishes dominance multiple times, at first through intimidating grace with his threatening appearance and the dramatic takeover of the VM, and then taunting her attempts at containment with the VM, saying the prickheads had better security 12 years ago. Grace tries to keep her agency, making demands of Smile, almost confident in the VM's ability to contain Smile whether what he said was a bluff or not. Her desperation has made her laser focused on getting Smile out of her head, but Smile has something to say, and so he makes another display of power to establish the dynamic of the situation that she's in. Smile obviously wants something from her, something he can't get himself, so he uses his position as a supernatural entity in the room and get her mind off for her goals to focus on the very, very active threat in the room. Now that he has her attention, Smile offers his services as a friend, an ally, more than a pen pal as he puts it. The important thing here is that he puts Arthur's motivations into question, presenting the idea that Arthur is not an authority on anything. He even highlights some of Arthur's more suspicious behaviors. I kind of want to provoke it. This seems like Smile implying that Arthur could be using Grace as a sort of test or guinea pig for the Smile entity. This corroborates my speculation about Arthur's behavior earlier. But this does lead to the question of why Arthur would even want to provoke Smile. Someone who has solved their problem doesn't go around looking up videos about their problem. Smile legitimately does have a point here. Why would Arthur be going around looking for Smile Dog Origins content with the context of what he's experienced? Smile hammers home the point again. He hasn't told you anything. And everything that he said is absolutely correct. The most contribution Arthur's made is showing Grace that the smile image she downloaded off of something awful was supernatural, and presenting half-assed shot-in-the-dark guesswork as to what Grace should do about her situation. He wants to appear to be an authority figure in the trio's dynamic, despite his only experience being that he knows that these entities exist only for an unspecified bit longer than Grace has. He could know more, but has refused to really share. And like I've said before, his proposals carry the sense that he's guessing as to what should be done as much as Grace and Davy are. The final bit to try to earn her trust, or at least her subservience, is through one last show of force, through supernaturally turning on her television and unveiling another clue. This gives us a lot of information in just a short span of time too. Smile isn't even confined to just Grace's laptop, so Arthur's suggestion of throwing away the laptop would not have worked in the first place. It would have only pissed Smile off, making the situation all the harder. Smile is giving them another lead, tangible information and a direction to go, backing up his desire to help, if only out of self-interest or self-preservation. By giving them this lead, it's possible that Smile is building rapport and trust to get Grace and Davy to start to question Arthur's behavior. Smile's involvement as a character is really fascinating to me. He appears to be some flavor of antagonist, the real monster so to speak, but it's put into question when it starts to try to assist Grace through presenting a new thread for Grace and Co. to follow. Although this only leads to more questions. Like, why would it do something like this? What does it get out of this arrangement? This iteration of Smile knows that it's not the source of the paranormal happenings. Could it be that it also wonders about its own origins? 
I love how the Chainmail Chaser story takes its own initial premise and then flips it on its head almost, with Smile being more akin to an ally with questionable motivations, an anti-hero, I guess, that holds its cards very close to its digital chest. This section lends to the idea that there could be something greater, some sort of force that could compel Smile to reveal its hand, some sort of more immediate danger, although that may not be revealed until later in the story. This is an amalgam of a corrupted early Jeff image from 2004 over the final image. What remains of this image has been distorted beyond repair due to faulty archival over 15 years. This still clearly isn't the original, but it's solid progress. It shows that the image must have originated in the West, crossed overseas, was edited further, and then became a major creepypasta back in the English internet. How did we get here though? How did we get to a shoddy archive of extremely early 4chan content? Truth is, this image is actually the final discovery we made. If you've seen our most recent video, this image was shown towards the end. You can probably see that these two are nothing alike other than both being forward-facing grinning monsters. So this led to that, but how? What is the connection? Well, we start by reverse image searching the face, leading us back to an old friend, Paranormal Prickheads. If you're new to the channel, an internet archive page of Paranormal Prickheads is what led to us finding the earlier Smile.jpg images. It may be worth trying a full exploration of the website in the future, as it seems to be mostly archived in both a repository of many forgotten old internet horrors. The page seems to be of slightly higher quality and content than the previous Smile Dog page, about a rumor of something called a Solar Plexus Clown Glider. As it turns out, despite never hearing of this before, it is documented elsewhere on the internet. Now the Prickheads page claims that the initial image was actually taken from a variant of the Smile Chain Letters, and was edited or switched out over time on the website meant to spread a rumor about the image's cognitohazardous effects. There are multiple images used, as seen on the page, though some of these images failed to load. This included the last image update on the website. This image is claimed to be stolen and used in a series of images called Pretty Face, which is thankfully cross-linked and archived. And here, here is the missing link. Now, Pretty Face actually corresponds to Pretty Face, one of the early file names of Jeff the Killer, as posted on the old Japanese web. So that got us thinking. The image didn't load, but the file name could still be grabbed. Assuming it was ripped straight from an image board, we did a Google search for the file name, coming across an old 4chan archive, and lo and behold, it contains the corrupted image. None of the other website results that are still online seem to have the image still working, so until someone from one of these old paranormal community sites reaches out, the corrupted image is likely as good as we'll get. Clearly some more modifications of the image were made between this and Jeff. The eyes are different and were likely re-added from a higher quality source later on. The mouth, especially the upper lip, also seems to differ heavily. The source of the original face still hasn't been found, but this is still a major find. Doubly so, actually, considering the origins of a previously completely unrelated legend also being found. But that's all for today. Thank you for watching. And one more thing. The next episode will cover a working timeline of the Smile.jpg image over the years, as best as we can approximate from the given information, accompanied by some theories about what exactly is going on. We'll see you then. Alright, now that we have context, I'll take my time breaking this one down. 
Here, we have a much more structured video, openly discussing the findings in a very, very deliberate manner. It's almost as if the chasers are starting to get their proper footing, so to speak. There is importance in the hint that Smile gave them by providing the red Jeff monster image about the solar plexus clown glider. They don't elaborate on what this thing is in the video, but I did a little research myself and I'll give you a little rundown. A solar plexus clown glider is a different chainmail image. In reality, it was often paired with malware that malicious senders would send to unsuspecting people. The dramatic effects of the malware would make the threats of supernatural death and torture be all the more believable, especially to naive early internet users. In essence, clown gliders are malevolent cognito hazards, where supposedly, if you hear the words solar plexus clown glider in that order, or see the image that it's attached to, that malevolent entity will be able to corrupt your solar plexus chakra, which in Hindu beliefs is responsible for manifesting your positive and negative emotions. The clown glider acts like a parasite, a demon that feeds on the negative emotions in your solar plexus chakra, and so when it corrupts you, it induces extreme psychological pain to cause as much negative emotion as possible so that it can feast. What's important about this is that clown gliders were informed by the science fiction short story Blit by David Langford. In Blit, there are cognitohazardous images known as basilisks, named after the mythological basilisk's ability to kill you with its gaze. These basilisk images are able to cause brain damage or death to anybody that sees them. Sound familiar? There are some parallels to be drawn between the effects of the clown gliders or basilisks and what Grace has been experiencing ever since that she made contact with Smile. Heavy migraines, headaches, possible hallucinations and the like. It could be that since Smile is working with Grace rather than just wanting to torment her, it's holding back some of its more lethal effects. She's also definitely been psychologically tormented by Smile for quite a while, given how most of the videos aren't even made by her anymore, and the recording and editing is covered by Davey for the foreseeable future, with Grace focusing purely on research. Clown gliders are also shown to be directly related to the Smile chain letters. This image is the one that Smile gave to the group. Note the name, chakraworm.gif. It's a direct reference to the clown gliders as chakra parasites. What's interesting is that when Davy presents the full list of images regarding the clown gliders on the Paranormal Prickhead's website, it's chakraworms3.gif that is given focus when the video starts being tampered with by unknown forces. Now, Paranormal Prickheads is a real website that you can visit, and in their catalog of images, you can see this exact same image under Anomalies in the Demons category in the Basilisks entry. This entry defines Basilisks as some kind of demons that behave like cognito hazards, sealed away from God's creation working to spread instead through the creation of humans, because God denied them the ability to appear in the real world. This is why they occupy human-made media rather than physically manifesting in the real world. The important part of this is the way that this image contains an example of a basilisk cognito hazard which I'll show right now. Look familiar? This is the exact same image that invades the Chainmail Chasers video, placing itself right over the web version 3 of the Clown Glider image list. What's even more intriguing is that this video doesn't match the current Paranormal Prickhead's website image contents. If you lay out the images on the website similarly to how Davey did in the video, you'll see that all four images are accounted for. The original Chakra Worm image is the one provided by Smile, the one that kickstarted this line of investigation, but the third one is revealed not to be the basilisk that invaded the video, but the pretty face image that would have become edited to be Jeff the Killer. So, given the basilisk's chosen placement on top of the spot where the pretty face would have been, it suggests that pretty face was in fact some kind of active basilisk or cognito hazard at some point. It's very possible that the edits of pretty face were made by internet users in the past that sterilized its cognito hazard's effects, turning it from a very dangerous digital demon into just another online image that got attached to a comically badly written internet story. Furthermore, you can look at the Chainmail Chasers community tab. You can see that the recent posts here have been in all caps, 
a speech pattern matching up exactly with the subtitles of Clifford the Big Smiling Dog. Although, there is one immediately important post by Smile that I would like to go over. It reads, That recent clip is not of mine. Are your craniums really so cavernous that you would attribute any basilisk to my spores? A minor example in of itself. I am powerful. That was a runt. You really do not seem to understand that I am not the one reviving these records. They are from the opened tomb to mark the cenotaph. I simply let it happen. As rude and snide as that message is, it highlights some key factors. First is that there are some different basilisks that can try to insert themselves into the Chainmail Chaser's YouTube video. The second is that Smile has the ability to bar them entry, as the Smile entity is a particularly strong basilisk or some other kind of unknown media affecting supernatural being. Smile simply allows it to enter without destroying it for some reason. It calls the basilisk that invades the video a runt, appearing incredibly insulted that you'd attribute something as weak as that to him. There's a lot of information in the community tab, but I'm wanting to save a lot of that speculation for a possible second video where I go over my critiques of the series, as well as a lot of supplementary media, such as the Ice Cream Monkey Fan Reupload channel, the Paranormal Prickhead's website, as well as the secret text found in its source code. Because, of course, the internet mystery has secrets in the website source code. Thank you, Scott. Welcome back to Chainmail Chasers, Davey here. Today we're covering a working timeline of the Smile.jpg images and every other image they've led to. This is a climax to everything we've uncovered in the past year, a compilation of discoveries and thoughts, and hopefully a way to pave the road forward. We start with our earliest discoveries back in the first two Smile Dog Origins videos. It is unknown which, if any of these images came first, or if they're all simply variants of the same image. The image entity can take the form of all three very readily, and they all share the same background. To jog your memory, the first is the one found on the Something Awful thread, the second is the one sent through the spam emails, and the last was part of a purposeful scare of the channel researcher. These can be reasoned to be the earliest images we have so far very simply. The Paranormal Prickheads page for the Smile Chain Letters says they've been going around since the early 90s, and the image on the CRT at the bottom is clearly one of these two images. This is said to be one of the earlier images associated with the chain letters, so we can link them to originating in around the mid-90s. Almost every other image we have can be connected to them in some way. Following this is an image we uncovered the origins of in our most recent video. This was originally from the Smile chain letters as well, but was stolen and used on a website called SolarPlexusClownGlider.com that was said to have gone defunct before the 2000s. This makes it plausibly from within the time period of the mid to late 90s. Davey continues on to document the history of some of the individual image instances. Although some images don't have any internet history, only really appearing when Smile is manipulating media. However, right as when he's about to cover the Clown Glider lineage of images, this happens. No, I know. There's no reason to trust what it says, really, but... <laughs> Smoke on yeah, 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 like, but you've, you've experienced this before, right? So you should know a thing or two about what I'm dealing with, and I, I uh, so, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh god, we have an Amario, I just ran in. I doubt they even Okay, are. but that, that doesn't really matter. Like, I'm saying that I think you should probably have an idea of what this is. Oh. Oh, fuck. I, 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 I can't. Alright, let's break this down now. First off is the fact that this is our very first IRL scene of Grace or anyone in the series so far. It's a very jarring change of pace from what's going on. 
The next is the question of why this video is here. From the context of this footage looking like it's a, from a laptop webcam, we can assume that this is Smile Dog's point of view, cementing that Smile does have ultimate control over Grace's technology. However, since Smile is assumedly a basilisk demon, he isn't a physical creature and can't interact with Grace directly aside from the psychological aspects of his cognitohazardous abilities. Grace looks to have put something over the webcam, suggesting that she knows or at least suspects that Smile can see through her webcam and wants to leverage her physical existence over him as he can't do anything about it despite his power. That's just a long-winded way of saying that she put a sock on the webcam and the dog is probably seizing. But this does make me wonder about what Smile does whenever Grace isn't around to spy on her bug. Pop, amazing. Mm, ice cream's so good. Mm, ice cream's so good. An alternative way of looking at this is to think about why this footage was put into this scene in the first place. It could be that Smile is using this footage to show Grace and Co, who it knows to be seeing these changes in order to implicitly tell them, I am still here, even when you don't think I'm listening. Or, Alternatively, the reason why Smile chose this footage in particular is to highlight to Grace how dodgy and suspicious Arthur is due to his more flippant attitude and strange behavior. The important question is to ask what it is that Arthur is saying. It's very hard to make out, but considering what Grace is saying, she's questioning him about his knowledge about Smile. She's asking about his authority on the subject, having dealt with a similar situation in the past. Heyo, editing Blanky here. Uh, before we get back to the analysis, I just wanted to add an addendum as to what's going to be coming up next. I initially thought that the muffled audio in the clip was Arthur's actual direct responses to Grace's lines of questioning, and the oddness of the responses is what got me to my upcoming conclusions. However, upon in further inspection, I noticed that the muffled audio is actually probably just voice chat and a video game going on in the background, which I mistook for actual plot relevant material. So, uh, whoops. Although, I'll keep the analysis part in, but just know that Arthur's actual responses to Grace are just very likely kept out of the video entirely, and I was looking too deep into a clip. Sorry. If you listen closely to what Arthur says, however, it's strange. He sounds like he's brushing off Smile Dog's accusation, saying stuff like, Bro's got smoke on me, and laughing it off. He seems strangely comfortable. This doesn't sound like uncomfortable laughter, but actual jovial taunting. You'd expect someone who's way in over his head to sound a lot more intimidated by a literal demon directly calling them out, but no. He's just living up to his word and choosing to provoke Smile instead. There's something off here, and I'm not sure what. <laughs> Moving on, we're back to Davy's theories, where he speculates on how smile images are created, ultimately landing on some sort of mutation-like reproduction, using the cognition of others as a vector for spreading itself. There's another reason it's placed after the other images, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Now these next two images are unable to be placed solidly in the timeline, as they're not tied to any specific internet presence. Rather, they have appeared in instances where the image entity has assumed control of media. Due to this, they are assumed to be early variants coming off of the first three images, as the entity has only demonstrated the capability to add in permutations of itself as long as they are not too far removed from itself. As a result, if they are present on the internet, they are likely to have originated in the mid to late 90s. Moving on is the updated Solar Plexus Clown Glider image. 
This one we actually have a pretty good date for, as the Prickheads page claimed it was popular going into the millennium, meaning it's from just before 2000, but distinctly following the original image taken from the smile letter. However, we're not done here. With the introduction of this image into the timeline, it allows us to explain our key theory of how this works, and why a timeline with so many images can happen at all. As these images are spread, whatever force that animates them causes natural image loss in different contexts to sort of mutate them, evolving into different images and manifesting different entities. That's why the known image entity can only assume forms that are relatively close to itself. Why early pictures are more similar to an actual dog, while later on they become more abstract and monstrous. In questions, the image entity describes spreading itself in an analogy of self-reproduction outright. This hypothesis has even more credence when you compare the images. The second solar plexus image, compared to the first, is clearly very similar. The site claims it was just updated to that appearance, but you can tell that whatever happened is no mere Photoshop edit. Same teeth structure, same head tilt, same ominous digits creeping from behind. But some things change. Eyes and teeth are hazy and undetailed, as if mid-metamorphosis. If you compare the first solar plexus image to one of the original images, the idea of metamorphosis still follows through. Same head tilt, same strange upper mouth structure, same lighting, but still very different. It's actually not clear which specific variant it came from, hence the dotted lines. Now if we bring in the last solar plexus image on the site, you can see the same principles carry through. The middle one lightened, now the last one is white and pale. The rings around the eyes have encompassed the entirety of them in the final image. The awkward contorted structure of the snout settles into an upper jaw teeth reform. The strange geometric edge on the left becomes even stranger on the final image. Again, these aren't edits, it would be obvious if they were. Oh, and as for the time frame on this one, we know it had to have come from around 1990. Alright, so we know that there is definitely some sort of mutation going on. It's almost like a parent-child relation between these images. It's similar to how biological parents and children carry similarities, but have enough differences to not look like clones. It's very fascinating to think about this metamorphosis theory because by this logic, any number of scary images found online could be direct derivatives of one another. From a meta-analysis perspective, this could be a nice reference to how horror inspires similar yet different horror with just enough to create differences with incremental creative mutations that can eventually lead to something entirely unrecognizable from the original inspiration. Such is the case with analog horror, which is a trend inspired by Local 58, which in turn inspired so many series, like White Stag, Gemini, Harmony and Horror, Vita Carnis, Backrooms, etc. There's also the way that this could retroactively explain so many things on the internet, it's astounding. What if the image commonly associated with the Russian sleep experiment is just another late mutation of the pretty face Jeff image, which itself originated from the smile image? What if it comes from a different digital genus entirely? Thoughts like this is what made me fall in love with the series as I have. Next on the chopping block is the smile.jpg image that directly preceded the creepypastas posting to the paranormal board on 4chan. Due to the vast difference in graphic style, it's either a fake or a very late metamorphosis. Granting that it's from around 2005 to 7 due to when it was archived, there could be any number of intermediary images. Regardless, no mental effect is present on this. What I like about this is that there's a lot of ambiguity on whether or not this image could be a metamorphosis. The idea that any image online, anything at all could potentially be cognito hazardous, as if the internet is a field of flowers to frolic through, not knowing that there are bear traps kept hidden right out of sight, and once you step in, it's too late. The world building aspect of this however is one to consider. If this truly is a late metamorphosis, does this imply that there is a limit onto how much one entity can propagate and mutate away from the original image before becoming sterile? If this isn't the case, and this image is indeed a fake edit and not a metamorphosis, then it also begs the question of if the real images are able to replicate without limit. After all, like Arthur, people would begin searching for posts to help with their problem, and people like Grace would be posting about the problem in the first place, potentially leading to the propagation of even more smile entities. It's a positive feedback loop that could lead to so much destruction, something that can haunt you from just one passing glance. Shut up! Ah! Uh. Uh. 
I don't fucking care. What's going on here is relatively unclear, so I'll show you my personal interpretation of what just went down. Alright, with that out of my system, I think I can stop being silly. Let's look at what the smile poetry means. A tree, rotted and desiccated, falls to the floor of the wood. If there was not a soul near it, would it make a sound? The interpretation of what the tree could be is very strange. I'm not quite sure what it could mean or what it would be a referring to. Speculation would be appreciated in the comments. My personal interpretation of what Smile means by talking about the tree falling to the floor making a sound is that he could be saying, if you died alone, would it even be noticed? Would anybody care? And then, if all dust shedding, slowly dying neuron machines in a room share a delusion, is it not real? The only information you have is your own. This one is very straightforward, the slowly dying neuron machines just refers to humans, and the shared delusion could just be the supernatural smile, possibly referring to himself as a delusion, but by sharing and being perceived, it all becomes real. Sharing possibly being a reference to how the internet lets stuff like smile get shared around, and by being perceived, it becomes real. The only information that you have is your own, is just Smile telling Grace not to trust what the others tell her, just hammering in a little bit more distrust. Grace is becoming physically ill from harboring Smile. It's not known if he's doing this on purpose, or if it's just a side product from the average human not being able to harbor cognito hazards like Smile. It's explicitly stated by Smile himself that he's a very powerful basilisk type entity. His spores could be too much for a human brain to contain or be exposed to for long periods of time, and we're just seeing the beginning of the effects. This video series so far is most likely taken over the span of a couple of weeks, so assumedly Grace hasn't really been hosting Smile for that long. And things are starting to get real, more intense, and if Grace's health is any indicator, things will only be getting worse. Much, much worse before they can even start to consider looking any better. If you can't tell by now, this is my new favorite internet horror series. It has a lot of potential, having already executed some standout bone-chilling scenes. And there's a lot of things at play here. It's a definite love letter as we're expanding the stories behind old internet horror media and breathing in new life. This series does so many things that I don't see in literally any other internet horror series. Most of them are just constrained to the contents of their videos, with some vague lore hints and the occasional jump scare. And there's just so much thought and care that's gone into this series to honor the horror of the past while still carving out its own unique identity. There are references to past digital horror tropes, like stumbling onto a haunted piece of media that torments the protagonist and their friends. There's a second channel with supplementary media relevant to the plot, and there's a group known for handling and potentially even containing monsters, and more. There's even the fact that the main crew has some sort of perverted Scooby Gang dynamic, complete with a magical talking dog. 
Now, I've praised the series before this, but I absolutely adore how they use the ambiguity behind the origins of prominent horror images in order to create their own lore and backstory behind them, using the stories and images as a launching off point in order to create something both original and unique in the online horror space. And there's so, so much supplementary material from the Ice Cream Monkey Fan Reuploads channel and the actual Paranormal Prickheads website that the Chainmail Chasers team created themselves, just to give the fans a little bit more to chew on. There's also the information kept in the channel's community tab, where characters communicate with the audience, including some very pivotal information and some very important figures in the story coming up in the future. Even the side material has secrets too, with hidden lines of dialogue and fodder for theories hidden in the source code. Now, I have my own criticisms about this series, but I just need to embellish on how excellent this series is and how it's been going so far, that being absolutely stellar. There's also the fact that each video in the series has not been a waste of time, simply setting up Chekhov's guns to be fired at a later date. I'll elaborate on this if I feel the need to make a second video on the series, this script is long enough as it is. It's looking less and less like only a smile dog horror story, and more of a great big homage to the entirety of digital horror and horror related media, and that, I feel, is to be celebrated. For now, I'll be eagerly awaiting more from the series, as the recent Paranormal Prickheads web ad uploaded to the channel and the more recent Ice Cream Monkey fan videos tease at season 2 of the series. With all new antagonists and plot developments between our leads, I hope that you'll join me when this series picks up again. And a recent update, but as March 18th, 2024, on the series creator's Twitter account, we do have confirmation that the main series is going to be picking back up again in April. There is literally no better time for people to jump right back into this series, so go ahead and take your time to watch, speculate, and theorize, and have all that fun stuff that enriches online projects like these. Until then, best of luck, and good night.